everyone, and welcome to the first Scots We Hate podcast of 2024. And I'm joined by actor and writer Forbes Masson to talk about his starring role in a new one-person adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, which is coming to the Royal Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh between the 13th and 27th of January. Hello, Forbes. Hello, hello. How are you so, doing? I'm really well, thanks. Good I'm really well. And this sounds really exciting, for, particularly it being a one-person show. So tell us about this version of Jekyll and Hyde. Well, it's written by Gary McNair, who's a bit of a hot thing at the moment in Scotland. He's just done that thing, Dear Billy, yeah. which I think he's bringing back. And it's a, uh, it's directed by a guy called Michael Fentiman, who uh, I first worked with at the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, about oh, 2010, I think it was. No, before that. And anyway, uh, I've done a lot of work with Michael. I really love working with Michael. He's a brilliant director. And uh, they've done a version of this before in Reading. And this is the second outing of it. This time it's a very Scottish version. And I've been very, uh, very lucky to, to be to be performing in it. And it's really exciting piece. It's, it's that thing about Jekyll and Hyde, because I, you know, I read it when I was young and I've read it again. And I always thought of it, it although it's set in London, it just reeks of Edinburgh. It's just got Edinburgh running through its scary veins, you know. Uh, and so it's great to be doing a sort of Scottish version of it in, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, uh, and just to be talking to myself all evening. <laughs> it's a bit nuts at the moment because I'm in rehearsals, it's just me talking to myself. Because I play, uh, I basically play Utterson, I play the lawyer who's, who, right. who, who's uh, in the book, but, uh, you know, I, I take on other roles as well, uh, not in a kind of, you know, putting on different clothes and stuff. It's all, it's quite, it's quite subtly done. And it's all, it's about an hour and a half. We haven't really, you know how long it's going to be yet, but it's, it's, and it's really, it's really dark and it's funny and it's, it's, it's good. It's going to be great. I think, I hope so. Hope so. <laughs> I think that's something that if people have only seen film versions, they maybe don't realise that from the book, it's kind of Utterson's story, isn't it? I oh. mean, that's, the, that's where the, the, the kind of narrative is. It is. And then there's letters at the end, you know, there's, there's Lanyon's letter and then there's Dr. Jekyll's letter, but it is basically, it's Utterson's tale. From through his eyes, and and it's just an exploration. It's a nice. This is a nice exploration of what it is to be uh, someone who uh, is around, who whose friend is is someone who's a bit of a monster, and uh, how how somebody could feel perhaps uh, responsible for that. But it's more than that. There's a sort of meta thing to it as well. It's it's what is really clever. It's a really clever piece. I don't want to say too much because it kind of yeah. it might spoil it for people. But uh, it's it's got a, it's a really interesting piece and it's it's going to be really fun to play. And think, Mike is doing a great job of directing it. You know, I think that's the thing about the original text is for a short piece of work. I mean, it's kind of novella almost. Mm. There's so much going on in it. As you say, you could look upon addiction, you could look upon mental health. You know, there's all these things that we still yeah. talk about today. It's very relevant. It is. It's about human nature. And it's also that thing, again, that Edinburgh thing of the duality, the whole thing, the Deacon Brody thing, the whole, which I think is what was the inspiration for, for Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, you know, the, the, the gentleman by day and the, the kind of doing evil deeds at night. But that's just that whole thing of what, uh, you know, what, we see how, we, how easy it is to sort of uh, dismiss uh, people like that as monsters or evil, but in actual fact, it's deep within all our psyche. It's deep within all of us, and it's part of our primal thing. And uh, it's a really interesting exploration of that. And Gary's script is really witty and smart and clever and 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 dark and scary. It's good. It's, you know, it's disturbing as well, which is great. And you mentioned that Gary and Michael had done this before elsewhere before you'd got involved so what was the process from your point of view what was the kind of collaboration in terms of that were you uh, coming to a kind of fait accompli or could you change things as well oh yeah i mean i've had a lot of input into it there was a few changes made before i even started on it and uh because it was reading rep it's a it's like i think it's a co-production between reading rep and the lyceum so i don't know if there was always a plan to bring it here uh uh, Audrey Brisson was played it the last time. I worked with Audrey; she's brilliant, uh, and I think they just thought of um, they wanted to make it more Scottish for this time. I don't know, but um, yeah, I had quite an input with. I like I've always liked that when I work in plays. I always like to have a bit of a, an input into things. So even just me saying the words makes it different. So you know, it's 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 been a really great process. It's been a bit staggered over, you know, because we had a Christmas break there. So it's interesting coming back this week to it in Edinburgh. 
it's great to be back in Scotland. And I'd been waiting for a while to, I'd wanted to do something in Scotland for a while. As you know, I'm, I moved down a long time ago to, to London and worked with Michael Boyd at the, the Royal Shakespeare Company for a long time. But I really miss, I miss Scotland so much and I'd wanted to come back and do something, but I just never knew what the right thing was. A couple of things had been offered, but it wasn't the right thing to come back and do. And then Michael approached me with this and I went, oh, this is it, this is the one, this will be fantastic to do to come back and 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 to come back to the Lyceum as well, because I had a history at the Lyceum. I hadn't performed there for 20 years. I did a play, a Peter Arnott play called The Breathing House, which actually was about Edinburgh. And I played a character in it called Gilbert, who was very much a sort of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde character. He was a gentleman by day and a, a rogue by night. Um, and I also, my musical Stiff was premiered here in 1999. So I've got a long, happy memory of working at the Lyceum. And then, of course, we're now taking, we're taking it on tour. We're taking it to Dundee Rep, which is amazing. I love Dundee Rep. I've done shows there, directed and written shows for Dundee Rep. And I'm going to Perth Theatre, where I started my career. Uh, I did Peter Pan in 1985 when I left drama school. And we're going to Mac Robert Arts Centre, which is near my hometown of Falkirk, which is now the only theatre that people in Falkirk can go to because the Falkirk Council have knocked down the Falkirk Town Hall. Right. I, I'm really angry about that, and I'm sort of trying to, fight for a proper art space for my hometown of Falkirk. So it's great to be doing this show in these places. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'd be great to be out and, out and about in Scotland again. That, that answers one of my questions about if this was going to be, you're taking it elsewhere, and that's fantastic. One omission, there's someone sitting in the south side of Glasgow at the moment. Is it coming to Glasgow? It's not coming to Glasgow. I think there was a problem. It's, it was quite a quick turnaround for a tour. And there was no real space available, sadly, because I was hoping to take it to the Tron, because obviously the Tron was my kind of artistic home for many years. But uh, we've not been able to bring it down. But hopefully, I mean, I think uh, hopefully it'll have another life and it might come back. Because I, I really would love to take it to Glasgow, because it makes sense to to go there too. Um, but yeah, no, and we're also Michael Fentiman and I we're dedicating the performance, the the production to Michael Boyd. Who sadly we lost last year and Michael was a huge influence well is responsible for my career really Michael was was so supportive to me you know I started off he basically discovered Victor and Barry the thing I did with Alan Cumming at the Tron when we were at drama school and then I did many plays with Michael at, at the Tron and he encouraged me to write and do stuff on my own and uh, then when he went to the RSC he asked me to go along and be part of the ensemble and uh, you know I owe so much to him and Michael as well. Michael Fentiman was invited to the RSC by my Michael Boyd. We both worked. Michael actually, Michael Fentiman assisted on a production of As You Like It that I played Jayquees that Michael Boyd directed. And we got to take that to New York. Uh, so we have, with a long association. So we thought it was appropriate. And we we asked the, Michael's family if it would be all right. And so we've we've dedicated this production to Michael, who is, you know, it's such a huge loss. I can't even express how, how, how huge it is. So as, yeah. as, as someone who went to the, the, the Tron during that period, I, it really was a golden age for that. It was. Thing, you know, with him. Yeah, I mean, Michael's, you know, uh, uh, the thing about Michael is he, he wasn't someone who blew his own trumpet, but he is, you know, uh, there's so much of Scottish theatre that Michael was responsible for. And that period, as you say, you know, I, as a young actor coming out of drama school, I remember going to see Michael's first performance because Alan was in it. Alan was in a production of Macbeth, Alan Cumming was in a production of Macbeth, and I just was completely blown away by it. I thought, this is extraordinary, I want to work with this man, and yeah. I'm so lucky I did. But this a whole pool of uh, performers, you know, Craig Ferguson, Peter Capaldi, loads of names, uh, uh, Lacey Smith, and all, you know, like huge names uh, that started off at the Tron, and then the bar was a real hub for artists and actors, and it was a real focal point. It was brilliant. It was a great, great period. I mean, you know, we're all, we all we all have guilty when you get to my age at 60, you kind of look back and, you know, rose-tinted glasses. But no, it was an extraordinary time. Yeah. Really amazing. Going, anyway. back to, going back to Jekyll and Hyde, how do you yeah. approach playing multiple roles? Um, it's interesting because, you know, Michael and I very decide, decidedly not want to do, like, it's Lon Chaney. It's not the man, man of a thousand faces. And I'm not doing different characters and really embodying it in that respect. Because sometimes when you're doing audio books, I've done a few audio books in the past. And when you're doing it on radio or something, you very much have to really find a way to sound differently and do that. But with this, it's quite subtle. 
So it's more to do with uh, an intention of the character rather than putting on a silly hat or hairy hands and false teeth, you know, <laughs> uh, and putting on different voices. It's more about a subtle shift in the one person so that it could be, you know, my character could be someone with multiple personalities or it could be someone who's, you know, so there's lots of different things that you could be taking from this. So it's not like suddenly wearing a T-shirt with, my character on it and take it yeah. off with another character, you know. So it's quite subtle. So it, in that respect, it's quite detailed work. Uh, so, you know, and, I, and we're still in the middle of it, really, because it's been, as I say, the, the, the rehearsal process has been quite uh, split up. So there's still quite a lot of work still to do. But I think it's I think it's going to be exciting and I think it'll make sense narratively. And it's also interesting coming to the tale because everybody knows, you know, there's no sudden surprise like when you first when some people first read that book they must have gone oh, oh my god but it's like with any sort of spoilers you know anything like that now it's like darth vader's dad or Dar not darth vader being the dad it's that sort of thing when you know that it's it kind of the, the 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 uh the interesting thing to do is how you tell the story without that having to be a crucial part so yeah. it's an interesting look at it's almost like artiston reflecting on and reflecting on having seen the signs and knowing his friend, and so this is it's, it's, it's interesting in that respect, but it still has its moments of of disturbance. <laughs> well, I think that's what makes it again very interesting as a text because it doesn't just kind of encourage a second or third reading, but almost demands it. You think, Oh, what have I just what's happened to you? I remember the first time I read it thinking, Well, how's how has this happened? Why has this happened? Going back. Yeah. And you know, suddenly you become more Utterston, I think. You become this kind of detective yeah. It's a detective, yes, that's right. It's like a sort of it's it's as a detective tale and, and a study of of a, a psyche. Yeah. I often wonder whether the reason he hadn't set it in Edinburgh, because like you, I agree, it's it's a very Edinburgh book. Yeah. Uh, so it feels like it's because you had the Holmes detectives and the thing of that time in London, and it's almost like, well, let's tap into a bit of that. And also, you might have been that thing of wanting it to be, you know, maybe just fighting away from his kind of roots to try and be something a bit more universal or a bit, a bit yeah. wider. And I suppose that I'm, I'm not sure when the Ripper stuff was, but it must have been. I, don't, I can't I yeah. strike that. I don't know. But um, the, the other thing, though, is apparently his wife, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's wife, read the first draft of Jekyll and Hyde and threw it in the fire. <laughs> there was some. Uh, it, it, there was some. Uh, whether it was she didn't like the draft because she was quite critical of his work, but whether it was she was critical of the work or she felt it was too, it revealed too much of people that they knew. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> so I don't know, but that's the story that I heard, which I find really. I think that's fantastic. You know, I think it's really great that you know there was because you know I certainly when we did the breathing house the Peter Arnott play. You know, at the time in the Victorian time, there was opium dens in Edinburgh. There was all this stuff going on. It was all, you know, there was a dark underbelly, as there is with every city, even yeah. now, that horrible dark underbelly of, of, of society that, you know, is attractive to some people. I love that idea. We can never go for dinner again, darling, if this book gets published. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, I more than that. <laughs> you mentioned the kind of hairy hands approach and the eyebrows, and it made me think of Frederick Marsh of the 1931, which I think is yeah. my favourite. I mean, I think there's something amazing about that. Oh, there is. Yeah. But the, the, I've been, I watched a bit of that, and it's that it's so clever that, they, that you know the camp, the way that they pan away and you come back to them, and the, the transformation and that thing with the I think they did it with that dark coloured makeup where they change the light and suddenly his face turns. But uh, there's there's none of that in this. There's no kind of I don't. I don't disappear like Eric Morgan behind a desk and come <laughs> up with a yeah with, you know, with hairy forgot. eyebrows. And, <laughs> but um, were there any portrayals uh, or any uh, portrayals of anything that kind of fed into your performance, or is this purely coming from yourself and the text and the play itself? I, I try not to. You know, I think always it can be a bit of a mistake to look at other performances of uh, productions. Like if I'm doing a Shakespeare or something, I don't. I don't tend to look at other performances because it can, you, even if you don't think you're, you know, uh, stealing or uh, whatever you call it, paying homage or whatever, there's things that you can, 
it's better to kind of find it fresh within yourself. And I always think of acting as is is about finding the character within yourself. So you're you're not putting on someone else's clothes. You're you're it's 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 coming from yourself, coming from within. Um, so I haven't really based it on anybody. Um, it's Utterson, me as Utterson, and, and we'll see how far we get. I mean, it's still long. As I say, we're still a long way to go. I'm, I'm not really, you know, we open in, in less than a week, but there's a lot of work to, well, no, we open in two weeks, sorry. Yeah. Panic. Um, <laughs> so there's still, a lot, still got a lot of work to do, but uh, it's exciting. Is the approach very different to theatre work than it is to film and TV in that sense? I mean, it sounds as though you're you're working on it almost right up to curtain, and maybe even after. Oh yeah, it'll still be changing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing about Michael Boyd. You know, Michael Boyd would continue to give you notes uh, and work on productions long after they'd opened. I mean, that was his his training was in Russia, where you know, in Eastern Europe, where they have uh, ensemble companies that that do can carry on plays for years and years and years and years, and they grow and the actors grow and the productions grow, and it's a constantly uh, moving and changing thing, which is the joy of what theatre is. It's a live event. It, a film, you make a film and that's it. And theatre can't be something you just go, there you are, that's it, print it and do the same. And a lot of, you do see a lot of theatre that is quite like that. It's that commercial stuff that is put out on the road and it's just, it's fixed and it doesn't change and it doesn't grow and it's dead. It's dead theatre. So, yeah, yeah theatre will, you know, this will change and, and grow throughout the process. But it's, I suppose this one's a bit more like making a film because it's, it's quite, it's subtler. Uh, you know, there's a little, we use a bit of, uh, yeah, we, so it's, it's a bit more subtler than the norm. It's just me talking to, to the audience or, you know, what would be one person. But I've, I mean, I've not done a lot of film and television. I always find it, like a lot of actors find film and TV a bit like just a, an eternal tech. It's like you never actually get to the point where you're, you know, if you're a theatre beast like I am, it's like that. I I live for that kind of adrenaline thing, which is is good. I just think it's the best thing in the world. But I do, you know, I've I've done a bit of TV and film, and I do enjoy it. But it's a different, it's a completely different um, technique. Right, right, okay, that's interesting. And the story itself, it's almost the classic case of the supernatural versus the psychological you know that thing that Scottish writers in particular seem to be obsessed by that yeah. double, if you like does that feed in do you does your version without giving anything away does it move towards one direction or the other or is that down to the audience to decide how think, things unfold I think there is a lot for the audience to to bring to this it's almost a bit like Utterson on trial that the audiences are the judge and, and he's defending himself and, you know, defending his role in the story. Um, whether or not it's about an exploration into the... I don't think it's necessarily an exploration into the supernatural. It's more about a kind of exposing the story uh, that it's a, about more scientific, about the about the fact that it is all actually scientific in a way, and it's about humanity rather than something out with us. That is something really that is there anyway. It's not some spooky thing, ooh, and a ghost, or, you know, some sort of something other. That the, the real horror is that it is it is it is there. It is it's something that is untapped. That is within us rather than it being, uh, you know, I think there's a bit where Gary talks about it in the end of the play, where it's, it's not, you know, it's easy to sort of dismiss monsters as, as, as something that's other, but what's most terrifying is that it's somebody that's your best friend or it's someone that you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's actually, you know, and it's about these evil deeds. Or, or what is the word evil? And it's just that some people do these deeds. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm havering now. No, lost it. It's interesting, but what you said right at the very beginning of his talking was how Utterson, um, you know, wants to almost save his friend or to at least discover what's happening with his friend. And I'd never thought about the kind of level of guilt, perhaps, that Utterson might feel mm -hmm. that, you know, I think you're right, we've all had friends or, or people we know who you maybe think, oh, if I'd done something different, could that situation have been different? Yeah. It might not have been. But that kind of... A human response to your friendship in that way. Also, Utterson is a lawyer. Yes. So he's defending, you know, he defends people. 
and the, the nature of the legal system is that people have a right to have a defense and you know so it's that there's that gray area of what is right what is wrong what is good what is evil what is human what is not human what is and it's all that sort of thing is weaving your way through that and and uh and whatever guilt he feels or whatever he feels of the uh, from being a, whether he feels part of the you know a, a, an enabler or whatever and it's like you said about you know addiction and things like that people that uh, you know are, are with addicts and how, how difficult it can be because you by merely just helping them you're you're making them continue to be an addict uh, but again, I think that, you know, I was thinking about the modern context and why this has remained such a relevant story. And you've also got things like the current um, uh, interest in true crime and and, yes. and, and and the criminal mind and all of these things which happens. Mm -hmm. And the criminal mind is always what is being examined here. Yes, that's it. That's dead right. Yeah. I've actually, funnily enough, over Christmas, I was sort of, I, I'd forgotten. I was just sort of switched on Netflix and went, oh. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, this is sort of where we are, where I'm at at this this show, and watching a few of these weird Netflix documentaries of people that are uh, near the wells. <laughs> so, so, is everything at the moment about uh, Jekyll and Hyde, or can you tell us about what's, what's next for you? At the moment, it's pretty much Jekyll and Hyde. There's a possibility I might be doing a play later in the year, but I'm, I can't really talk about that yet. And there's other things in the pipeline that are kind of coming and going and, and it's all a bit kind of up in the air. I had hoped to be a bit more uh, uh, able to talk about them, but I can't at the moment because it's all looking a little bit more uh, hesitant than it was before. But the good thing is, what I can tell you is that uh, Alan Cumming and I, uh, to celebrate our 40th anniversary of doing Victor and Barry, have been working on a book and that's coming out this year. Uh, and uh, it's all about uh, Victor and Barry's. It's called Kelvin Side. It's called a Kelvin Side. Oh, this is terrible. I've just completely forgotten what it's called. Is it Compendium? <laughs> You're right. Thank you for that. Victor and Barry's Kelvin Side Compendium, a meander down memory close. But, you know, I'm getting I'm getting to that age. Of, I'm worried I'm going to one-man show. I'm gonna, what happens if I forget my lines? Uh, there we are. Uh, yeah, we're doing that. That's coming out in the summer. And it's been great because Alan and I have uh, been in touch over the years, you know. But in doing the book, uh, we've really rekindled our uh, desire to work on something else. So we've got various ideas at the moment that are kind of uh, on the burner. I know about that only because your publisher, 404 Inc., have been in touch with me to say oh, this book is coming out. So I'm looking good. forward to reading it. Yeah, um, they're really exciting, really exciting uh, young publishers. And they're, so yeah. they're, they're let that out next, this year. So. And it Great. just makes me think, as a, 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 as a final question, you just mentioned there the double act that you've been in and you're associated with. Is there something Jekyll and Hyde-ish about a double act? Um, I, I don't think so. I think, I don't know if it's Jekyll and Hyde. I'd say more Jekyll and Hyde if you were doing a ventriloquist act, I think, because right. it's more your, ed, your ego and all that stuff. Whereas, you know, with two of us, um, the thing with Alan and I, we just, when we were at drama school, we just kind of clicked and we discovered a similar sense of humour and we sort of became quite telepathic kind of comedically and we kind of bounced off each other and you know we, we were worked together for over 10 years and it was a long time and you know looking back when we were working on the book we suddenly go god we did so much when we were young and, we, and it was like it was crazy it was so fast and and it's extraordinary how we managed to, to stay sane doing it all really because it was all like completely blew out of proportion in a way so it was right in hindsight it was probably right when we sort of decided to put them to bed otherwise they'd completely we would be like more common wise and that's all we'd ever done and we both always wanted to do other things that was what why we went to drama school and we wanted to do exciting work but what's been so great is coming back to it and looking at the high life and sitcom we did and looking at the old victor and barry stuff and a lot of it still stands up and a lot of it you know still makes people laugh and there's a tremendous fondness for it and that's what's really good and the fact that, you know, we're still here and, uh, you know, who knows what we'll, we'll come up with in the future. Yeah. Been, and, and, I mean, like anything, any kind of uh, relationship has the highs and lows, you know, and it's, it's great to be coming to this point to be just full of love and, and, and joy of each having each other's company, which is great, you know. And, and did you say that the warmth that uh, people like myself have for the work from that time, you know, it really does still endure, as you say. 
Yeah, it does. It's it's great. You know, it's lovely. It's nice when people come up to up to me and talk about that sort of stuff. It's good. Forbes, lucky. thank you so lucky. much for taking the time to talk to me. Pleasure, sir. All, all the very best uh, with the play when it comes around, and uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I shall go and try and cultivate my moustache to look as, as sumptuous as yours. Thanks, man. Thank you. And we'll be See back you. soon with someone completely different. Mm -hmm.